you can look at the entire Stoic philosophy as a system of payment. You know, what are your obligations? What do you do and what must you do in your life in order to justify your own existence? And all of the Stoic practices are those forms of payment. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. On this week's show, we're going to be discussing the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. Uh, just like most of you out there, uh, we here at Mind Matters Studio have been impacted by the, all of the craziness that's been going on across the globe over the past month. And it seemed like it'd be a good time to look back on one of the, uh, on an individual who's so bravely, firmly, and solidly stress the importance of integrity and character during times of turmoil and chaos. And this individual is none other than the former slave turned philosopher to thousands named as Epictetus. Um, just for a little background, uh, he was born in Hierapolis in Phrygia, and he spent his his early years is, uh, you know, the child to a slave. And it was in this culture that it's theorized that he picked up a very strong religious bent because the Phrygians, they had a cult for the great mother and they would regularly have great orgies and they were very intense in their, their, uh, their rituals and in their religion uh, towards the, the great mother. And so Epictetus, comes across as being a much more religious Stoic than really any other Stoic that came before or after him. And this is a, this is a big part of the works that were written down by his student Arian when he, was, when he became a philosopher at Rome after he was freed by uh, his master and set up a, a very successful school. Uh, until he was exiled. But these works um, that come down to us over time have, been, have shrunk and shrunk until now we only have four volumes out of a, an estimated eight original volumes of discourses that were gathered by a student, Arian, and that relates a, uh, every sort of kind of experience that students or you know people looking for advice and um, the kinds of interactions that they would have with Epictetus and the things that he would tell them, the the kinds of uh, conundrums that people would come, uh, you know, come into through just daily life, and his sage advice on every single one of those uh, situations. And so, as a book, it's not a systematic um, philosophy, but it's more a, a record of the kind of advice that this brave and strong-willed man, um, known as a marvelous old man. Um, would give to, to people in need. And so we thought it'd be a good time to kind of take a look at some of the things, the advice that he offers to people, because it's, it stretches, you know, it's just as relevant uh, today as it was two millennia ago. And so with that, we'd like to just kind of look a little bit about at what he, um, what he thought, what was important. And most people out there are well aware of what the Stoics considered important, and those were things that, things that are only within our control. But, you know, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into that and, and to flesh out what it means to, um, to live with integrity within such a world, within that system, and what it means to decide what is really within your control and what is outside of your control. Because Epictetus wasn't without his flaws, you know, philosophically speaking. He did have an idea that, that people could, um, could kind of create their own ideas, that we had complete control over our thoughts, and that by having complete control over our thoughts, we could have complete control over our emotional reactions, and that we could basically um, achieve a state of absolute happiness as long as we pursued what was good and we understood that what was good was what was morally good and that what was evil was what was morally evil. And so that as long as we desired what was good and we desired to 
be that and within, within ourselves and to, def, to find the good and to strive to be and act with in, integrity, we would eventually reach a state where we had some semblance of what they called eudaimonia. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of that, but it, it's just a state of happiness associated with the virtue and of knowing that you've done everything you can in your life for the good. And Epictetus himself, you know, he was born to a, a slave. Uh, mo his mother was a slave, and he was, you know, a slave for much of his early life. We're not exactly sure when he uh, was emancipated, but he, uh, it, it's, there's some controversy over how well he was treated or what the kinds of uh, situations he, he was in as, as a slave, but undoubtedly his desire for freedom and his desire to teach everybody else what it meant to be free was imbued with the the suffering that he experienced in being constrained and being forced as any as you know any slave in that kind of a situation would be but he was fortunate enough to to travel around in circles that were um that were high up at, at the time you know clearly he was uh, he was um how would you say he was his master was the clerk of court for Nero. And so that gave him the opportunity to see what happened in the halls of power and what it really meant to have great wealth and great power. And then to, at the same time, be able to evaluate whether or not such wealth, such power, such material um, uh, affluence was truly a, a good thing to have. And as an individual, after he was emancipated, and after he had studied under the preeminent Stoic sage of the day, uh, Rufus, Marconius yeah. Rufus? Uh, Musonius. Musonius Rufus. Um, he started his own philosophical school and spent the rest of his life devoting himself to teaching people how to be good just how to be good people and how in and of itself that was the aim of success that was how you would determine your success in life and that no matter what life threw at you if you took the proper attitude towards it you could find yourself in a position where you were better off you had learned something you had proven yourself and that and in his in his brilliant way he he could relate um, the stories from the Greek pantheon of, of gods um, in order to, to achieve such a, you know, in order to uh, um, impress upon his students, you know, these, these epic feats of the gods, of Hercules, of Heracles, and how they themselves should look upon their lives as tests and trials, just as, you know, the, the tests and trials that Hercules found himself in turned him and proved to the man that he was, and that we also should take the tests and the trials that we have in front of us and use them to prove the kind of individual that we are and to always act with integrity and to keep our character in mind. So with that said, um, is, did you guys have any place that you'd like to start? Well, I just wanted to go back to a couple of things you said about his background and just give a couple, um, couple little anecdotes about about those aspects. And one was his, his own teacher, Musonius Rufus, um, who, well, I'll read a bit. We talked about this book when we did our two shows on Stoicism, uh, A Guide to the Good Life by William B. Irvine, kind of on the, um, the, more, the modern, modern versions of Stoicism, the people that are actually modern practicing Stoics today who are very few in number. So on Musonius, Irvine says that, um, just a bit about his teaching style. So he says, indeed, when a philosopher lectures, this is like a, you know, a real philosopher, like you were saying, so not just uh, someone with their head in the clouds, but someone who's actually embodying, the, embodying what they're teaching. He says that this philosopher's words should make those in his audience shudder and feel ashamed. This is Musonius's philosophy. Um, rather than applauding him, uh, they should be reduced to silence. According to Epictetus, Musonius himself apparently possessed the ability to reduce his audiences to silence, for when he spoke, his listeners felt as if he had discovered and laid before them those traits of which they were secretly ashamed. So right there, that gets back to our show on um, Paul's uh, philosophy and the, 
in, in his letters in the New Testament and about the, the practice of what the prophetic word is in the Christian tradition about um, laying bare and exposing and bringing light on the, you know, the secrets of the heart that, uh, that you wish to be concealed. So for uh, Epictetus, um, the classicist Anthony Long, according to Irvine, basically sums up the conditions that he placed on his students as the following two. One, um, wanting to, they, they need to satisfy the condition of wanting to benefit from philosophy. And two, understanding what a commitment to philosophy actually entails. So um, Irvine writes that Epictetus knew that his words would be wasted on students who didn't yet recognize their own inadequacies or who weren't willing to take the steps necessary to deal with them. So that just shows the, the actual um, practical level of the philosophy. It wasn't you go and you listen to the lectures and you just you know take notes like it is in, in modern day um, philosophy departments. It was an actual, it was an actual pro practice, like a one-on-one -on -one or many-on-one -on or one-on-many interaction and teaching opportunity. So the way that Irvine puts it is that um, according to Epictetus, he, he told his students that a stoic, stool, a, a stoic school should be like a physician's consulting room and that patients should leave feeling bad rather than feeling good. Um, the idea being that any treatment likely, likely to cure a patient is also likely to cause him discomfort. <clears throat> According to Epictetus, the primary concern of philosophy should be the art of living. Just as wood is the medium of the carpenter and bronze is the medium of the sculptor, your life is the medium on which you practice the art of living. So the third one um, I want to come back to, as you mentioned, his like the influence of religion on him um, at, as a, at an early age with the, the, the great mother cult, and, but also with the, his uh, anecdotes about like the Greek gods, because in his writings, Zeus takes a, a large role, and Zeus is... Uh, you know the prime the prime god of the of the Greek pantheon, and um, so Irvine points out this, and so of course there are, there's the the you know arguably accurate depiction of the Greek gods as these kind of um, pretty much human like figures with their flaws and you know all their uh, all their character uh, flaws and everything like that, like basically human personality traits. But he points out that for uh, Epictetus, Zeus was. Um, quote, a thoughtful, kind, and loving God. And when he created us, he had our best interests in mind. But, sadly, he appears not to have been omnipotent. So in creating us, we were, uh, there were limits to what he could do. In his discourses, Epictetus imagines having a conversation with Zeus, in which Zeus explains his predicament in the following terms. Epictetus, had it been possible, I should have made both this paltry body and this small estate of thine free and unhampered. Yet, since I could not give thee this, we have given thee a certain portion of ourself, this faculty of choice and refusal, of desire and aversion. He adds that if Epictetus learns and to make proper use of this faculty, he will never feel frustrated or dissatisfied. He will, in other words, retrain, retain his tranquility and even experience joy, despite the blows fortune might deal him. Elsewhere in the discourses, Epictetus suggests that even if Zeus could have made us free and unhampered, he would not have chosen to do so. Epictetus presents us with the image of Zeus as an athletic coach. Quote, it is difficult to show what men are. Conse uh, oh no, sorry. It is difficulties that show what men are. Consequently, when a difficulty befalls, Remember that God, like a physical trainer, has matched you with a rugged young man. End quote. Why do this? To toughen and strengthen you, so you can become an Olympic victor. In other words, so you can have the best life possible. Seneca, a previous uh, Roman Stoic philosopher, by the way, argued along similar lines. God, he said, does not make a spoiled pet of a good man. He tests him, hardens him, and fits him for his own service. So this is kind of like the, what I think of as the, the rugged, manly aspect of Stoicism. It's that, um, you know, it's not, it doesn't pamper individuals. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't give in to their, their weakest aspects and the, the, the weak parts of their personality. It's actually to develop that, uh, that inner strength to overcome any, anything that the world will throw at you, essentially. And this is just, this is a theme we've covered 
on you know pretty, pretty much every show this year so far at least on mind matters is this um taking the taking the lessons that life gives you and actually utilizing them for your own development as opposed to seeing the world as this hostile place that's just out to get you it's so actually this is a place where it, something can be learned from any situation um, no matter how difficult um, you know even death even what people probably consider to be the worst thing that can befall them even death is something to to learn from and to to approach something to prepare for and um and you can got you can die a good death that comes back to gurdjieff too about like in our interview with joseph azizi um to prepare not to die like a dog you know to, to, to die an honorable death um, because it could come tonight it could come tomorrow it could come 30 years from now but you will die and you can die like a, you know, like a, a, a dog, a, a scared or a scared or ravenous dog, mm -hmm. or you can die um, with dignity and with understanding <clears throat> and knowing that you'd made something of your life and kind of digested the lessons of the, the material that has been provided for you in your life because you don't have control. That's one of the things getting back to this locus of control that the Stoics talked about. There are certain things that are under your control. And those are the things you should focus on um, on affecting with your with your through your own will. Mm -hmm. Then there then there are the things that you can't control, and the things you can't control are the things that you have to then um, decide and put into practice how to react to and how to how to um, deal with and digest those experiences. So the you know your entire life you're presented with these things that are out of your control but what is always in your control is your reaction to them and how how you react to them and what you do um in response to them um having now having this new experience how how do you now act based on that new experience mm -hmm. um it's like it's a curveball that you haven't experienced before so now that's that's what puts you to the test that's that's the olympic victor olympian um metaphor that that um, Epictetus was using. It's um, now you're put to the test, and so now what are you going to do with? It? Now what are you going to do with it? And um, and then like there, it's not like you have this one opportunity. You have this curveball thrown at you, and then you screw up, and it's like okay, you know, you're done, mm -hmm. um, fail. No, it's like now you have that experience, and now if you if you fail, now you have a little bit more data a little bit more information about the way the world is the way that the possibilities that can be um the possibilities inherent in the world and inherent in your life and now you can prepare for the next time that happens and you can you can say okay well i, I wasn't prepared for this situation now i can be prepared for it in the future to a better degree but since i wasn't prepared for it beforehand you know what else might i not be prepared for you can kind of let your imagination go wild a bit and say okay well actually well, maybe something will pop into mind. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that possibility before. Now you can prepare for that possibility that you weren't even. It wasn't even a. It wasn't even within your realm of possibility. You know, to go back to our some of our previous shows on philosophy. Well, yeah, that that ties right in with his uh, his very religious uh, uh, streak that he has that runs throughout basically everything that he says, and that's uh, that he he firmly believes that that aspect of us that is within our control is on par with the the gods that our ability to think and reason is that part of us that's connected to the divine and it's the only thing that we can really control is our own thoughts and our own opinions and so he often he recommends to people um that they they make a a duty of kind of of examining the opinions that they have and the judgments that they have in just any given situation, that they make themselves sensitive to what they um, to what they truly think about something. You know, this. You know, whenever you're confronted by just about anything, you know, the first thing that pops to my head is you're driving down the road and the guys, you know, you've got some jerk, you know, passing you, and uh, you know, just immediately I say he's a jerk, yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, what a so jerk! That, what a jerk! This is this guy's a jerk, right? He's like, but you always for Epictetus. The important thing is always to keep in mind your own integrity and your own um, that that part of you that's connected with God and to treat yourself in with that kind of integrity and to ask yourself would a person with this integrity uh, entertain such mean and base thoughts off of you know such little 
just anything. Yeah, such pettiness. Such pettiness. Would mm-hmm. would somebody with that, you know, I mean, no. Obviously, if you're, you're going to want to root out those kinds of opinions that you have about just about anything, anybody, that pop up automatically throughout the course of your day. Because as Epictetus says, and this is one of my favorite lines of his, is that if um, if it found out you if you found out you were the son of Caesar, you we wouldn't be able to um, to to listen to you through because you'd be insufferable. But you find out that you're the son of Zeus and you don't care. <laughs> he's like, this is the you know he's like this is the thing is that you know each of us has this this spark this connection to you know to the divine, and that we have we should treat ourselves with that level of integrity that we have to um, we have to treat the world and ourselves and our own thoughts um, like they are you know that important I think the beauty of his writing is that so much of what he presents um, particularly in the Enchiridion mm-hmm. is uh, aphorisms that were taken uh, from his larger body of, of work are presented with the you know very practical, day-to-day experiences, uh, much in the way that Gurdjieff would have presented situations, psychological realities, and insights into the ways in which people think, uh, addressing certain things as ego and self-importance, and all those things that are to be recognized and discarded as unnecessary and energy-wasting. And it's through these uh, several dozen aphorisms that he he gives these little snapshots of uh, situations and circumstances that um, one might find themselves within that you could look at and reflect upon and think, you know, I have a uh, an analogous experience like that and i i may have uh, erred on the side of ego or self-importance in that particular situation or i can see how uh, this is a very common uh psychological condition for most people because hey you know there it goes in myself mm-hmm. by the same token there there are things that he expresses in his aphorisms that um i think we sometimes intuitively realize for ourselves as truths about what the higher virtues are or what good character is, things that we may have seen other people demonstrate in what they write or how they behave. And so this is a a kind of a, you know, we call it moral philosophy or philosophy in general, but this is just really very insightful uh, ways of approaching life and being. And there were so many of these that came up where I thought, oh, you know, this is, uh, this is something that I'd read from Carlos Castaneda. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, this reminds me of Paul. Or this reminds me of even something Sun Tzu said in The Art of War. Uh, all of these different ancient wisdoms that... You know, there's a reason, like you said earlier in the show, Corey, that that this work is still around, even if it's been diminished and and people don't really know who Epictetus was uh, or that he was a forerunner of so much of what Stoicism presents to us today and in what people are drawing on when they're writing new books and and presenting a whole slew of articles that we sometimes see on Sot. Uh, he was he was the man. He was epic. Yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, on that note, there was uh, to give some example of how he sort of puts some of his wisdom into it, into these very natural, identifiable situations. He writes: Has any man been preferred before you at a banquet, or or in being saluted, or in being invited to a consultation? If these things are good, you ought to rejoice that he has obtained them. But if bad, be not grieved because you have not obtained them. And remember that you cannot, if you do not the, if you do not the same things in order to obtain what is not in our power, be considered worthy of the same equal things. For how can a man obtain an equal share with another man 
when he does not visit a man's doors as that other man does, when he does not attend the attend him when he goes abroad, as the other man does, when he does not praise, flatter him as another does. You will be unjust then and insatiable. If you do not part with the price in return for which those things are sold, and if you wish to obtain them for nothing. Well, what is the price of lettuces? An obelisk, perhaps. If then a man gives up the obelisk and receives the lettuces, and if you do not give up the obelisk and do not obtain the lettuces, do not suppose that you receive less than he who has got the lettuces. For as he has the lettuces, so you have the obelisk, which you did not give. In the same way then, in the other matter also, you have not been invited to a man's feast, for you did not give to the host the price at which the supper is sold. But he sells it for praise, flattery. He sells it for personal attention. Give then the price. It is for your interest for which it is sold. But if you wish both not to give the price and to obtain the things, you are insatiable and silly. I love that. (laughs) Have you nothing then in place of the supper? You have indeed. You have the not flattering of him whom you did not choose to flatter. You have the not enduring of the man when he enters the room. And this speaks to so much. It speaks to all of the politically, uh, ideologically motivated um, uh, goals that we're seeing right now in, in obtaining things for the self that aren't earned, for the lack of personal responsibility and hard work that goes into earning the types of things that people expect to have or, uh, or, or demanding from a government that has been, um, in their mind, keeping them at a certain position. This gets back to Jordan Peterson, of course. So his aphorisms are littered with this type of uh, thinking where we have to really examine our own personal expectations of other people, of systems that are all around us. What are we willing to pay personally in order to have the things that we're envious that others have? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it says, you know, without looking at how that really works and it's very basic, uh, you're, you're a child. And silly. And silly. <laughs> and uh, the, there's, there's so much in that concept or that idea of payment, too. So he's talk, he uses an example. Is, was it lettuce, like a head of lettuce that he was talking about? Right. So like yes. buying lettuce and comparing that to um, the, the social status that, or the social status, um, not symbol, but the, um, just the things that happen in life that are a result of that social engagement that you have with other people in, uh, on a certain level and in a certain manner. Um, so you, you flatter someone, you invite them over, you go to their, you pay them a visit to their house. Like these were all, these are all these, uh, social practices that are designed to, um, establish a relationship and then get something out of it. It's the payment that you make in order to receive the, the social status. And so there, there's two levels of this payment, but for the Stoics, there was also, um, kind of your, your cosmic duty, which was this followed the 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 Greek um, Stoics, which was an entire system of physics, logic, and ethics, and how they were all they were all intertwined. The Romans kind of got rid of the uh, physics and logic to a large degree and just focused on the ethics. But um, through a through an understanding of the nature of the world and one's place in it, then there were certain um, <clears throat> implications of that way of looking at the world. So, because, for instance. Um, man is rational and is imbued with that spark of Zeus's rationality, then there were certain things that followed from that, including, um, well, you had to behave rationally. It was your, your duty and obligation to behave rationally, and that had, an, that had implications for your own um, personal behavior, your character, your social interactions, what you focused on, pretty much every aspect of your life. That's why it's the art of living. And so what is the payment that 
we have to give to the universe, basically, to pay for our own existence. What are, what, what are we here to do? What is our purpose? That is, that is central to Stoicism. So the, you can look at the entire Stoic philosophy as a system of payment. You know, what are your obligations? What, to, what, do, you, what do you do and what must you do in your life in order to justify your own existence? And all of the Stoic practices are those forms of payment. So just like you have to give a, you know, a denarius or whatever to get, to get your head of lettuce, you, and just like if you're, if you're playing the social game and you, and you want something, you have to make the payment, well, those things are all kind of like on a, on a pretty low level for the Stoic. It's like, okay, well, what's the, what's the real payment you have to make? Mm -hmm. And, um, well, getting back to, you, you brought up the, the political angle and the kind of expecting something from nothing and um, kind of wanting what you are envious of in others and, well, things like that. But I want to get to to something that Irvine says about um, what Epictus, Epictetus would say about some um, modern phenomena like that. But to lead up to that, there's a discussion on insults. So we talked about this too when we did our show. Well, I think we talked about it in either our Stoicism show or and or our one of our Gurdjieff shows, because they both said something similar about insults. It was the thing about if someone calls you a fool, well, they might be right, in which case, why be angry at them? And if they're wrong, then why let it bother you? Because that person's obviously a fool. And, that was, and if they're right, they, they might as well uh, call, call me out for a lot of other stuff, too, because, heck, I have a lot of, I yeah. have a lot of faults. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, that's the stoic way of, of accepting insults. Um, but for... Epictetus, the kind of starting idea is that, according to him, the the self is the source of all um, the whole the source of all benefit and harm to oneself. It is the self is the self itself. It's like the, that is the source isn't external. It's not people being mean to you that cause you harm. It's the it's the harm the 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 harm comes from yourself and essentially allowing that. Uh, allowing that statement in this case, that insult to to harm you. So, one of Epictetus 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 Epictetus's lines <laughs> is: uh, "Remember that what is insulting is not the person who abuses you or hits you, but the judgment about them that they are insulting." So this is putting the onus of that source of your reaction on yourself, as opposed to that other person. Oh, you know, look at what that other, look, listen to what that other person just told me. It's like they're totally unjustified. It's like, well, you're the one taking offense to it. It's like that's just a, that just shows an inner pettiness on your part and uh, an inner weakness and uh, um, a lack of control over your own your own self because um, you don't have to be offended. It's like that person might be an idiot, in which case why be offended? And he might be right, in which case here you are acting like a total idiot when what that person said was completely accurate about you. So get over yourself. Um, so that there is that, that is, it's that judgment that you make yourself, which relates back to what Gurdjieff would call the formatory apparatus. It's the, the associations, the automatic associations that we, that we form that, basically filter all of the experiences that we have something happens in the external world it gets filtered through this you know all uh, through this associative mechanism in our mind that then automatically colors it with a certain um, connotation or a certain feeling um, a certain like emotion so we react just completely mechanically to the insult that has just been made to us by this person with no um, with no active reasoning going on in the moment so that's really what the stoics recommended is this process of active reasoning about the things that happen in life and in, in, in this case insults to actually stop for a second and reason about the situation well is what that person is saying that is, is what that person saying true in which case well well maybe it is oh i am like that well why should i be insulted if like my music teacher tells me i'm a i'm a you know i played that totally wrong that you know my technique was horrible and i'm not paying attention it's like well it's because he's right, right? Well, I have a philosophical and, question for, for the both of you. And, and uh, I hope this isn't too much of a digression. But w when you were saying all that, Harrison, you know, you mentioned the active reasoning that would be involved in examining an insult, for instance, so that it, you, you mediate what might be a painful statement to you without getting hurt. You're, you're thinking about it. In, in thinking about these things, is there a level of uh, 
is there a level of understanding this or work on it or assimilating all of this for ourselves where we become detached enough where we don't even have to reason so much. We automatically kind of uh, accept or have knowledge of how this insult has been relayed by who, what it really, you know, a perspective on it, what it really, how much weight it should be really given almost instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a, um, I can't remember if it was Epictetus or one of the others, one of the other Roman Stoics who was talking, said something similar, but in a different domain, he was talking about, um, oh, what was it? The, Oh, basically doing good deeds, like charitable things, um, doing good things for other people. He said that for a, a, an actual Stoic, they should do do those things basically as a, a matter of routine that the the Stoic himself doesn't even notice himself doing them. It should, it, should, it should just be second nature to just do these kinds of things, which other people struggle to do or do for social status or, um, or for any other reason. For the Stoic, a practicing Stoic that is developed to a degree along that, path that way it should just be without a second thought and just not not e second nature and not even noticed afterwards like you should sh should shouldn't even necessarily remember that you did it it's just because it, it's just like um getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth it's just something you do naturally it's a habit that you've established so so yeah i'd say that at, at a certain point certain ways of certain ways of of reacting and acting should just become habitual to the point where you don't even need to actively reason about it because you've actively reasoned. Well, ideally you've actively reasoned about it so often in the past mm. that you don't need to do it anymore. It's not, but it won't just, um, you know, it's not like a fried chicken just flying into your mouth. It's not free lunch. It's, you have to work for it to start out with. And then, um, but then it will become second nature after practice. Um, and this kind of leads into where I was going with this, with the, uh, bringing it to modern issues and modern political issues. Um, about this, it, it relates to this idea of free lunch because there is the element of um, of that envy. For instance, like with uh, billionaires, like um, everyone hates billionaires, of course, um, naturally. Um, but how many people who are en who are really envious of billionaires would actually be willing to do the things to that billionaires do to be to become a billionaire whether good or bad you know whether shady or or just working 20 hours a day um mm -hmm. there's there there are all kinds of elements that need to be taken into account well would you be willing to either cut those corners and be so dishonest or to work that hard for the few people that have actually managed to become super successful relatively free of um you know unethical behavior well if you if you are then i'll listen to you then, then you then, then you're your feeling and your opinion might have some value. If not, then, you know, why should I listen to you? Um, on a slightly different um, line, this is what Irvine writes at the end of his chapter on insults. He says, We live in a time, to be sure, in which few people are willing to respond to an insult with humor or with a non-response. These are two of the, uh, the recommended techniques for dealing with insults that the Stoics used. Indeed, those who advocate politically correct speech think the proper way to deal with some insults is to punish the insulter. What most concerns them are insults directed at the disadvantaged, including members of minority groups and people with physical, mental, social, and economic handicaps. Disadvantaged individuals, they argue, are psychologically vulnerable. And if we let people insult them, insult them they will suffer grievous psychological harm. Advocates of politically correct speech therefore petition the authorities, government officials, employers, and school administrators, to punish anyone who insults a disadvantaged individual. Epictetus would reject this manner of dealing with insults as being woefully counterproductive. He would point out, to begin with, that the political correctist movement has some untoward side effects. One is that the process of protecting disadvantaged individuals from insults will tend to make them hypersensitive to insults. They will, as a result, feel the sting not only of direct insults, but of implied insults as well. Another is that disadvantaged individ individuals will come to believe that they are powerless to deal with insults on their own, that unless the authorities intercede on their behalf, they are defenseless. The best way to deal with insults directed at the disadvantaged, the, with, uh, at, the disad, at the disadvantaged, Epictetus would continue, 
is not to punish those who insult them, but to teach members of disadvantaged groups techniques of insult self-defense. They need, in particular, to learn how to remove the sting from whatever insults are directed at them, and until they do this, they will remain hypersensitive to insults, and will, as a result, experience considerable distress when insulted. It is worth noting that Epictetus would, by modern standards, count as doubly disadvantaged. He was both lame and a slave. Despite these disadvantages, he found a way to rise above insults. More important, he found a way to experience joy, despite the bad hand that fate had dealt him. The modern disadvantaged, one suspects, could learn a lot from Epictetus. Uh, so, no comment. I won't comment on that, that statement. <laughs> no, that's, um, you know, that, that gets back, you know, it's, Epictetus, he kind of seems like a harsh taskmaster. He sounds like it in, in many ways, but I, I really think, just reading more and more about him, I see him, he's more an angel of mercy to those of us who suffer from having bad attitudes and from, you know, from not really knowing, as he would say, you know, what is within our control and what isn't, and putting all of our, our work and our desires and our innermost hopes and dreams into things that, you know, in that just will just wash away, you know, with a, with a, a little bit of a, you know, the, or with a massive flood these days, you never know. But um, for Epictetus, you know, that was where the, the religious portion really, uh, really shined through, is that you can see that he had this desire to, to show men that there was something, there was something greater than, all of, than anything that Rome could offer. You know, even you, you can go and you can, you know, price grain and you can sell grain on the markets and you can talk this and you can go to these courts and you can do all this dining. And, you know, at the time, it's just the, this, um, just Babylon, really, you know, it's just similar to today, you know, this, the same, you know, you can sit on your phone for, you know, 18 hours while you're locked up in your house and you could do, you know, this or that, you could watch Netflix for hours and hours, but he would, you know, he'd say, you know, don't ever forget that divine part of you that desires freedom. I think a big part of the, uh, his, the, the value of all of what he's trying to convey is that there is this immaterial gold. There is this non, um, ostentatious superficial uh rich richness or, or riches that one can attain by building one's character by being healthy in the in the sense of uh having values and having ethics for oneself and and ways of behaving that are appropriate to one's relations to others and one way he conveys this uh, in the fragments portion, he says, patients are displeased with a physician who does not prescribe to them and think he gives them over to disease. And why are none so affected towards a philosopher as to conclude that he despairs of their recovery to a right way of thinking if he tells them nothing for their good? So what he seems to be saying is we're very reliant upon the most obvious treatments for physical disease when we have them, when we go to doctors, where we expect some kind of medication or treatment that's going to make us well physically. But how often do we recognize a sickness of the soul, of the character, of emotional and psychological difficulties? And where is the person's expectation and rightful demand that a philosopher or someone who is insightful, whether they be a psychologist, a therapist, a, a writer, a, a leader of morals and virtues, there, there is far less of this expectation that, that they be healed from within on this other more um, uh, less materialistic uh, sense of being. So that's one of the things that uh, is... It's like the thread that runs through all of his writing, it seems, that uh, instead of building one's house and having all of these externals that would seem to reflect rich riches and, and taste, that this 
that the ri- that the real riches and the real taste are in how one comports themselves with others and how one behaves and responds to mm. uh, their situation. Yeah. And one of the ways that Epictetus um, recommended to put this into practice, you know, how to comport yourself with others, was this relates back to, again, um, our previous discussion with Joseph Azizi about Gurdjieff's morning preparation. Um, because it, uh, Epictetus said, or advocated, to prepare for your interactions with other people. To basically, um, like if you know you're going to be interacting with someone during the day that annoys you in a particular way, to prepare for that. Like basically visualize it to yourself. Okay, realize this. I'm going to be interacting with this person. I know when they do this activity or they do this or, you know, they scratch their you know nose when they're talking to you or something like that. Um, if or if, if it's something more serious than that, something not you know, so not something just so trivial that sets you off for whatever reason, but just to recognize that and to prepare for it. So when it actually happens, you've already got it in mind. It won't affect you to the degree it does when it comes out of nowhere, because it really it isn't rational to use the Stoics phrase to interact with the same person repeatedly and to be constantly surprised. You know, at the things that annoy you, it's like, oh, they're doing that again. Oh, they're doing it again. Well, yeah, what do you expect? They do that. And you get upset every time. Does it make any sense to get upset every time they do it when you interact with them regularly? No, <laughs> it's, it's totally stupid. So, so what are you going to actually do about it? Th- to, get, to relate this back to the morning preparation, it's if you, um, to, you basically enter that kind of that relaxed, collected state and then picture that to yourself prepare for your day. I'm going to be interacting with this person. Chances are they're going to do this thing that sets me off. Well, does it make sense that it's going to set me off? What do I want to be set off? What does that say about me that I lack that I lack control to such a degree that something so minor is going to uh, upset me to such a great degree? Well, prepare for it. It's going to happen. So when you go into that interaction, you're ready for it. You you can you can even treat it like a game. Okay, well when's it going to happen? Let's see if I can if I can predict it, and if I'm ready for it when it comes. So you're waiting for it, and then it comes, they do whatever minor little distracting or annoying thing that they do, and then you can observe that reaction for yourself, in yourself, without um, just reacting automatically and mechanically to, to that you know, minor affront from the, the universe and the external world um, that, uh, that upsets you so greatly. Um, it's a way of... Well, Epictetus described it as establishing a certain character and pattern for oneself. So you create the pattern every morning, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the morning. If you don't think about it in the morning, at least, hopefully at some time during the day, you'll, before the actual event, you'll be, you'll think about it and be prepared for it. But you establish that pattern for yourself. I'm in this pattern where I'm not reactive. I want to hold that pattern throughout the day and throughout my interaction with this person so that I'm not a slave to the 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 just the automatic reactions that pop up in me as a result of just the you know the dis, the displeasing manifestations of other people, um, yeah, it's going to happen. Other people are annoying, and uh, well, we haven't talked about Marcus Aurelius, but um, um, Epictetus was probably Marcus Aurelius's um, you know top guy, top influence, and one of the things Irvine points out in the book is that Marcus Aurelius. If you asked anyone, they'd say he's such a great guy, you know, the people that interacted with him, but he had this just disdain for people. He thought that everyone was just annoying. Every every single person was just this annoying slob that was just, you know, just a pain to be around, but he recognized this about himself and he and despite all of that, he he acted um with dignity, you know, and magnanimity towards other people. And other people appreciated it, but they probably they, you know, they didn't from his perspective, they probably didn't appreciate it enough. They were still annoying slobs, but it was his duty to himself to actually act in a, a way becoming for, well, an emperor, but um, but also just for a, a human being and for a stoic. And you can't do that if you don't prepare for it, um, unless you're just some saintly being that um, you know manifested itself on earth and is just perfect in every way. Um, you've got to work at it. Yeah, and you could even say that it's uh, for Epictetus, you know, life itself is kind of just, you know, we, we come into this world and, you know, for him, we're all pretty much fools. And, you know, 
he deigned to you know show people what it what it meant to actually become a you know full human beings but the unfortunate thing uh, with epictetus's philosophy is that there really isn't a great beyond uh, you know there isn't a, necessarily a, anything that we're working for mm. in his philosophy so we you know you can do all this work to live the stoic good life and then afterwards it's you're a drop in the sea again and you return from whence you came mm. and another problem with his thought is that there is no such thing as evil you know unfortunately for what, everything that he describes about the human condition and all of the evils that we that this um, way of thinking that this philosophy uh, helps you to overcome. He didn't see evil as evil. He had himself. He he taught that you had to attain the perspective of God, um, and you know from God's perspective, even evil was good. You had to have good in order to have evil, and you had to have evil in order to have good. And so, from his perspective, that meant that there was no really no such thing as evil. And unfortunately, that doesn't mean that there is not evil. I mean, because mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously, if there's evil yeah. in your system, then that means that evil is real. Yeah. And unfortunately, as human beings, we can't attain that perspective. You know, we still we still struggle, and we have to labor in a world where evil is is a very real thing and it's a constant you know it's a constant concern everybody is worried about some kind of evil you read the news and there's always some new evil some form of evil sometimes it's hyped up sometimes most of the time it's just evil you know telling you what evil really is you know and hoping that you're fooled but um that's one of the biggest uh things that i've taken away just through reading epictetus is to know what you're going for when you're when you read it and when you're when you're reading Epictetus, it's it's probably best to be looking for an attitude. Hmm. You know, he, that's what I think he offers more and better than anything else is that I can't remember the name of those monks who help you up Mount Everest. Do you remember the name of that of that? It's like a tribe. They they help you make the yeah. climb up yeah. this treacherous mountain, right? And Epictetus is something like that. I think for many, many, many people throughout history, he has been there to coach you in your, you know, the darkest times that that so many people, you know, go through, and that will probably, you know, it's just never end. His words will always be relevant, and so I think that that's if you're, you know, if you're going to read Epictetus, don't expect it to be perfect, you know, and don't expect mm -hmm. to get the the full picture on what you know man's place in the cosmos is. But expect to get a hard-ass attitude, you know, that you are a son or a child of the divine, and that you should treat yourself that way, and you should treat others that way, and that you should never allow yourself to, be, um, to become just a nasty rascal, as he would say. <laughs> well, Corey, I'm glad you said all that, actually, because uh, there were portions of the fragments that uh, seem to present false equivalencies like well you can either be you know a poor but but have good character or you can become you can be rich and be an absolute jerk and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to look like that right. exactly and so using your own critical faculties uh, to suss out what may be good advice and and what is um, less than uh, truthful or less than insightful is important uh with a lot of this material and with that <clears throat> we're going to wrap up today's show um, we hope that uh this finds you well and healthy and if you like the show hit like subscribe and share it everywhere that you can uh have a great week and we'll see you next time everybody bye